People stop their cars on the highway, get out of them, and lift their heads in wonder. In the cities, everyone takes to the streets. Balconies and rooftops of houses are full of people staring at the moon in shock. It's red. Some people scream that it's the end of the world. Some seek shelter. Indeed, the usual white moon now looks like it's been doused in red paint. There's no need to be afraid if you see such a thing. On the contrary, enjoy the view, because you have witnessed a rare astronomical phenomenon. This is a total lunar eclipse. Here's the Sun. It's in the center of our solar system. Mercury, Venus, and here's Earth and the Moon. The Earth takes 365 days to orbit around the star. At the same time, the Moon revolves around the Earth and completely orbits our planet in 27 days. The Earth creates a shadow zone, and sometimes the Moon passes through it. The shadow is cone-shaped and gradually narrows. The Moon is 238,000 miles away. That's like nine lengths of the equator. At this distance, the width of the shadow is about 2.6 times the width of the Moon. When the Moon is in this zone, direct sunlight doesn't reach it. That is, it should have disappeared, but instead, it becomes red. All because the Sun's rays pass through the Earth's atmosphere. They scatter, and most of the blue light disappears. But the red and orange rays continue and hit the surface of the Moon. Voila! You see a phenomenon called the Blood Moon. By the way, this curvature of light occurs at sunsets and dawns. The atmosphere scatters the blue light, and you see a red and orange sky. If you were standing on the surface of the Moon during a total lunar eclipse, planet Earth would be exactly between you and the Sun. So you would be able to observe the solar eclipse. The surface of the Earth would become entirely dark for you. All you'd see would be the Sun's corona illuminating the edges of the planet. The Earth from the surface of the Moon is almost the same size as the Moon from the surface of the Earth. Such a red eclipse of the Moon is rare because several factors must coincide. One of them is that the Moon must be full. Usually, you can see two total lunar eclipses a year. In 2038, you'll be able to see four such eclipses. And the eclipse itself can last up to 108 minutes. But this is rare, and the last time such a long blood moon was seen was in 2000. Many years ago, people didn't know so many facts about our satellite, and the sight of a red moon frightened them. It was a bad sign and a harbinger of trouble. People who knew the schedule of eclipses could take advantage of it. For example, Christopher Columbus had an astronomical almanac and knew when the next lunar eclipse would occur. He frightened the inhabitants of the Caribbean islands when he predicted the red moon. Once upon a time, the moon used to be a red ball of lava. This was way back in time, 4.5 billion years ago. Now this is our solar system. It's full of dust and asteroids. They're constantly bumping into each other, playing space billiards. This is Earth. It's just beginning to cool off from the constant asteroid and comet impacts. But then, Theia appears on the horizon, a planet the size of Mars. It had a chaotic orbit and was approaching Earth in a spiral. A collision was inevitable, and at one point, one of the biggest crashes in our solar system occurred. Theia struck the Earth at an angle. It ripped out part of the Earth's crust and threw it into space. The Earth, in turn, absorbed part of the planet that rammed it. The debris from the collision circled the Earth for a long time. They were a kind of ring, almost like Saturn's. Debris in orbit collided and piled up around a common center of gravity. And that's how the Earth got the Moon. There's a theory that this collision helped give birth to life on our planet. Theia hit the Earth at a perfect angle. If the crash had been head-on, both planets would likely have been destroyed in a massive explosion. If the impact had been tangential, then there wouldn't have been enough debris in Earth's orbit to form the Moon. But we got the lucky ticket. The Moon stabilized the Earth's rotation. The collision shattered the planet's solid crust and allowed oceans to form. All comets have beautiful long tails. It's nothing but a popular misconception. In reality, comets are very difficult space bodies to spot. They usually spend large amounts of time far away from stars. There, in the darkness of space, they remain rather inactive and completely frozen. 
Comets only get tails once they come close to a star. That's when they start warming up. This process makes them form some kind of a cloudy atmosphere, which is called a coma, and a distinctive tail. The tail always points away from the star that influences the comet. It happens because the tail gets blown in the opposite direction by solar radiation and solar winds. That's why the tail can often be in front of the comet, not trailing after it. Now, let's look at a light year. This very notion makes us believe we speak about time here. But in reality, light years measure distance. NASA's definition of a light year goes like this. The total distance that a beam of light moving in a straight line travels in a year. And since light moves at a speed of 186,000 miles per second, a light year equals almost 6 trillion miles. Hey, do the math! Now, people often believe that in space, you experience zero gravity. Hence the weightlessness astronauts feel on the International Space Station. But that's not exactly true. Gravity is one of the most important forces that exist in the universe. Thanks to it, the Moon can orbit Earth, and the Sun doesn't float away from our home Milky Way galaxy. But the astronauts on the ISS experience not full-fledged, but microgravity, which means very small gravity. The gravity on the space station is only 10% weaker than the gravity on Earth's surface. But astronauts are constantly in freefall. The spacecraft, the people inside, and all the objects aboard keep falling forward, not down, but around our planet, following a specific orbit. And since they're all falling together, the crew and the stuff inside seem to be floating. That's why astronauts can move things as heavy as hundreds of pounds with their fingertips. And even though microgravity is often called zero gravity, they're very different things. Now, it may seem as if the sun is always on fire. At least, that's what it looks like in pictures. But in reality, our star is a giant ball of gas. Hey, I can relate. Nuclear reactions happening in its core at all times makes the sun burn. Every second, hundreds of millions of tons of hydrogen are converted into almost as much helium. During this process, huge amounts of energy are released as gamma rays. Then these rays turn into light. In other words, the sun does emit blinding light and incredible heat. But it's not actually on fire, because no oxygen is involved in the process. A human can explode if they get into open space without a spacesuit. Well, contrary to popular belief, taking off a spacesuit during a spacewalk won't be as dramatic as it's often pictured in movies. A person will lose consciousness due to a lack of oxygen after 15 seconds of being in outer space without protection. Before it happens, the person should breathe out as much air as possible. Otherwise, this oxygen will damage their lungs from the inside. Then, without the protection of the spacesuit, which is like a mini spaceship, the pressure inside their body will drop. This will cause even more serious troubles. And even though this person definitely won't burst, they won't want to stay outside for too long. Black holes are giant, scary, cosmic vacuum cleaners, they say. But in reality, black holes are more like fly traps. They don't look for things to munch on. Instead, they sit out there quite passively. Only when a star comes too close does a black hole spring into action. Even so, only those space objects that cross a certain border get ripped apart. If the Sun were suddenly replaced with a black hole, Earth's orbit wouldn't change. At the same time, Earth's temperature would be different. There would be no solar wind, and no magnetic storms created by the Sun would affect our planet. And let's say the black hole that replaced the Sun had the same mass as our star. Then, according to the law of physics, Earth would have to come very close to get pulled into this black hole. What can survive in space? Well, people can, if they have an excellent spacesuit. Spacesuits are, shall we say, kind of a needed item in the vacuum of space. Without one, you'll have to stay inside the spaceship or modular dwelling on the Moon or Mars. Currently, NASA has only several older spacesuits ready for use outside the spacecraft, like the International Space Station. NASA's Artemis mission to the Moon is planning to have new suits designed for both men and women. It has a quarter-billion-dollar budget for them. These new suits are much less bulky than the older ones and much more fashionable. But what other creatures besides people can live in space? Three named animals were sent into space, and they all came home safely. Does that qualify? 
Two dogs, Belka and Strelka, spent a day inside a Russian spacecraft in 1960 and became media stars upon their return. The USA launched a chimp named Ham on a 16-minute ride into space. Space starts 62 miles above the ocean level and only takes a rocket a few minutes to get there. Ham, who wore a spacesuit, performed all his button-pushing tasks admirably and is honored in the International Space Hall of Fame in Alamogordo, New Mexico. But tardigrades can actually live in space. Tardigrades, or water bears as they are often called, are brown and look like teeny tiny grizzly bears and are one of the most miniature animals with legs. They have eight of them. Most species of tardigrades have no eyes, but some do. It's possible to see water bears with a good magnifying glass, since they average about a half millimeter in size. Sprinkle a little water on moss and they'll come out. They can walk about one body length per second and run at about two body lengths per second. Water bear eggs are easier to spot because they're bright white. The European Space Agency took water bears to the International Space Station and left them outside for 10 days. They survived. They still survived with no air, water, almost a perfect vacuum, harmful solar radiation, extreme cold, and heat. Well, that doesn't sound very fun, does it? In extreme conditions, water bears rely on their exoskeleton, or tun, to protect themselves. In laboratory tests, this exoskeleton could withstand immense pressure at over 87,000 pounds per square inch. That's quite a spacesuit they got. Water bears have even been frozen solid for 30 years. And when warmed up, the water bears revived and were still able to reproduce. As we search for life in space, as we explore Mars, these types of extreme life forms become essential to understand. If water bears can survive literally every environmental condition, can we conclude that life is everywhere in space? Extremophiles are life forms living in extreme conditions, such as other planets might have. Movile Cave in the country of Romania is one such place that could just well be on another planet. All life on Earth, on the surface of the Earth, is carbon-based. It means that carbon atoms act much like a universal Lego block, to which hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen atoms connect to form the molecules that the cells of living organisms are made of. But not in Movile Cave. Movile Cave was sealed off at least 2.5 million years ago. The water that percolates up through limestone rock has formed a lake in the cave, a mix of hydrogen sulfide, poisonous and corrosive, and ammonia. What could live in this toxic soup? Well, sulfur-based life forms. An entire ecological system without light or photosynthesis exists inside Movile Cave. The food chain is built on chemosynthesis, microorganisms eating sulfur-based chemicals. 33 species of sulfur-based creatures were found living in the hostile environment of Mulville Cave. Shrimp, scorpions, centipedes, snails, etc., etc. Mulville Cave is an alien world deep underground full of sulfur-based life forms. If creatures like this exist in Mulville Cave on Earth, what can we expect to find living in outer space? Bacteria. Bacteria can live in outer space. And fungi, too. Bacteria form the base of the food chain, and bacteria have been proven to be able to live in outer space. In the 1980s, cosmonauts on the Mir space station complained that something was growing outside the station's windows and blocking their view of Earth. It turned out, upon inspection, to be bacteria and fungus, or fungi. The windows, made of quartz, were being damaged and weakened by what was growing on the surface. Fungi were also found to be eating copper on some of the cables. Mold was found growing in some places on the outside of Mir. The space station was under attack by microorganisms. Scientists took this very seriously and began to investigate. It seems that in a sterile environment such as space, bacteria come out of their hiding places when no other microorganisms are around. Cosmic radiation may even help them mutate and adapt to the space environment. Turns out there are plenty of planets in the universe, and even in the Milky Way galaxy, that have liquid or frozen water on them. The closest one is within our solar system. It's Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. Scientists are almost sure that underneath its frozen surface, there's an actual ocean of water. But it's too soon to be hyped about possible life on such planets. Liquid water is only one of many things that have to come together for life to appear on a planet. 
A star in the galaxy GSN 069 is likely to turn into a planet the size of Jupiter in the next trillion years. It might happen because of the star's regular encounters with a black hole. First, astronomers noticed unusual X-ray bursts that were strangely bright. They went off every 9 hours. After studying this phenomenon for some time, the scientists realized it was a star moving in a unique orbit around a black hole. The dazzling flashes? It was the material getting slurped off the star's surface by the black hole. It turned out that over millions of years, the black hole had already transformed the red giant into a white dwarf. And the process isn't going to stop whatsoever. Astronomers have found some traces of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. On our planet, this gas, colorless and flammable, is often found where microbes live. No wonder a new theory suggests that there might be life on Venus. But even if there was some life on the evening star, it could have only appeared in its atmosphere. Probably no living organism would be able to survive the planet's extreme environment. Venus's surface is extremely dry, there's no liquid water on the planet, and the pressure there is 90 times greater than that on Earth's surface. The temperatures often rise higher than 900 degrees. That's hot enough to melt some metals. As for vacations there, I'll pass. In fact, there's a place millions of light years away where there's a whole floating space cloud made entirely of water. There's so much of it that we could fill all our oceans 140 trillion times over. Slightly more than what we need. Water on Earth is actually a puzzle shrouded in mystery and covered with riddles. The most popular theory is that it was brought to our planet by icy comets and asteroids that left behind not only mighty craters, but the liquid substance thanks to which we can now thrive. But in space, there's a whole lot of organic matter, and under specific conditions, it could yield so much water, it would be enough to fill our oceans thousands of times over. Researchers conducted an experiment in which they heated this organic matter and obtained clear water and oil. If this is confirmed in future studies, it could mean that even oil appeared on Earth not only thanks to fossilized remains of living beings, but came from outer space as well. And yet, there might just be about 6 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way galaxy alone. The latest data has shown that every fifth sun-like star can have at least one planet in its habitable zone. And not just any planet, mind you. It has a rocky core and surface, and it's of comparable size to the Earth. Being inside the habitable zone of its star, such a planet would have high chances of becoming home to living creatures. Microbes, at least. And if there are billions of these planets in our galaxy, you could safely say that at least one of them is not only habitable, but inhabited already. And now, multiply this by the number of galaxies in the universe, also considering that many of them are much bigger than the Milky Way. This gives us billions upon billions of sun-like stars and Earth-like planets, and some of them are surely more like ours than others. And get this, we might be able to walk upright because of supernova explosions. About 2.5 million years ago, a supernova sent cosmic rays to our planet. They triggered a series of electrical storms in the Earth's atmosphere, which turned into thunderstorms. Those in turn caused wildfires in Northeast Africa, where our earlier ancestors lived. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.